Thank you very much. The name of the day is um, social society, secrecy, and the global market. That will be the key issue for today. So let me introduce our first speaker today. It's for, for students here at the school. It's a well-known man, Mr. Guttorm Schellrup. is a professor here at the Norwegian School of Economics. He has published a wide range of um, economic journals worldwide, and his research on multinational corporation and tax havens. Mr. Schellrup will speak about the nature of secrecy or jurisdictions, or tax haven, as they also are called. Please, Mr. Schellrup, the floor is yours. I'm good to go. Okay, so I prefer to talk about these jurisdictions as secrecy jurisdictions and not tax havens, although in my talk today I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably. Uh, I'd like to call them secrecy jurisdictions uh, because what they do is that they sell services to foreigners mainly where information is private about what is going on. And they do this Combine this with what I will call a ring-fenced legislation and lack of effective supervision. So these services that they sell, these favorable rules of legislation that they have applied to foreigners only, locals are in general supervised and they're taxed. So by ring-fencing I mean that there is two set of rules, one for those who reside, live and work locally and one for foreigners who want to buy services set up firms. Um, these secrecy jurisdiction firms, they are owned by foreigners. They cannot operate locally in the tax haven or in the secrecy jurisdiction, if you like, because the legislation, the interpretation of the legislation is seen and the consequences of it is seen as so harmful that they will not allow it to work domestically. That means that these firms are really operating elsewhere in normal states where normally the owners of these firms live. And if there is any harmful side effects or externalities that follow from their activity and the legislation in these tax havens, it goes on in states that we are calling non-haven states. Normal states like Norway, for example. Um, the adverse effects of secrecy um, can be detailed and, and discussed. Um, economists like to talk about them as creating asymmetric information. One party knows more than the other party. In secrecy jurisdictions, we have hidden information about who the real beneficial owners are. It's not easy to find financial records if we find annual accounts. They are often insufficient in detailing what is going on. These jurisdictions are also characterized by lack of response to inquiries and lack of effective supervision and monitoring, which has consequences, which I will come back to. This is worrisome, and it's not worrisome because I say it's worrisome. I don't need really to lean on, uh, as will be clear to you as I progress, on Nobel Prize winners here, but I will nevertheless lean on the Nobel Prize in 2001, where three very distinguished uh, gentlemen, Akerlof, Stieglitz, and Spence, sort of in different areas carved out that asymmetric information, hidden information, creates costs to markets and hampers economic growth. We have, as parties, to overcome these information asymmetries, and by overcoming them, we incur costs. The most obvious cost for some of you who sit here is, for example, that if you represent a tax authority, you are striving much harder and has to put in much more resources to figure out what is going on in a secrecy jurisdiction than you have to do if you were to go to Sweden or Norway and figure out what is going on. In financial markets, if we have a financial institution who has hidden depth in an SPV vehicle, for example, this creates uncertainty as to how much depth is hidden there, and if there is much more than what we already have seen, what that causes in the market is higher interest rates, to take care or get paid for that uncertainty. No, that hampers growth as well. So there's just a wealth of examples that we could talk about that, that phones uh, the reason for why asymmetric information is bad. Now in normal states, like in Norway, um, 
tax privileges or any privilege is supervised. And the reason why we're supervising them is because we don't like those privileges to spill over. So in Norway, we have a favorable treatment of agriculture, but we would like to limit it to agriculture. And it is hard for other firms that are not part of that sector to get into those agricultural privileged schemes. In secrecy jurisdictions, there is a lack of supervision compared to normal states. Why? Well, first and foremost, because supervision doesn't have an income side. Why? Because firms in these jurisdictions do not pay tax. Secondly, these jurisdictions are very often very tiny. So there are very relatively high costs for them to engage in monitoring, just to set up and, and, and do an audit of accounts, for example, is very costly, even in a normal state. For these states where such audits would not be purposeful for any means of collecting revenue, they are just too costly to set in. And they don't benefit the local economy. Why? Because these firms are not allowed to operate locally. So there are no local customers, there are no local creditors, etc. So why should they supervise? And finally, supervision does not benefit secrecy, which is at the core of the business model of these jurisdictions. Um, so the lack of supervision, and that's one point I'm going to bring to you, creates really a second layer of secrecy. We may ask for an annual report or financial records for a company, and the company registry may look it up and find that it is there, but it may be may not be there also, or it may be insufficient. And then we have a ping pong game going on where they request the firm to supply more and the firm sent, we've already sent you this, you just failed to register it, etc. Um, shell companies um, is one way to conceal information. A state that registered a company is required by international rules to collect proof of customer's identity. One of the side effects of lack of supervision and monitoring is that it is possible to set up such untraceable anonymous corporate vehicles who can then be done to conduct activities and when something goes wrong, we cannot figure out who are the ultimate beneficial owners. And it's not only going on in, in tax havens, um, it's also the case that this is going on in jurisdictions that are linked to secrecy jurisdictions. I have a quote here. Um, from Jason Sharman, who will talk uh, tomorrow to you guys, where he says that in the United States and the United Kingdom, anonymous companies are freely available to anyone who has an internet connection and a few thousand dollars. Now, this is very worrisome because if we worry about supervision and monitoring in secrecy jurisdictions, and someone comes and tells us that we have a problem in our own backyard as well, um, this is something we should pay, uh, pay, take notice of and do something about. The, the point is that by being able to achieve anonymity, we lower the costs of any type of wrongdoing that we can think of. Um, I'm also going to talk to you about the example of Cyprus because we have an excellent business um, newspaper in Norway, Dagens Næringsliv, who has worked for a long time on just looking at how the company registry in Cyprus works. And they have found that they're up to 10 years behind in firm registration. The papers are stacked all around on floors, tables, under tables, over tables, in corners, big heaps. They don't check upon delivery whether the actual required information is there. The guy that sits and do this just takes the note, the firm name, and so on, and, and just <laughs> puts it aside. Um, and they really don't punish people who don't comply with these rules. And the head of the registry is basically saying, if you haven't delivered records or they are not in line with what they should be, you could go undetected for a long time. The EU and the FATF are surprised over this, but I am not surprised, and this is what we have been telling them for years. And the question is, why should they be surprised about this? International monitoring of these jurisdictions have up until now basically been based on that legislation is in place, not that it is enforced. Why should this be a surprise then, right? It is quite clear that we're dealing with jurisdictions that are not really interested in complying because they have been dragged into this 
against their business model, which is to be paid for services, firm registration, accounts, and so forth in exchange for secrecy, lack of supervision, and uh, the whole set of, of favorable laws. So we basically need to audit them. And I know that the international communities have plans for this. It remains to be seen whether these new plans and rules will be effective. Um, opportunity makes thief. What do I mean by this? Well, this is a, a, a well-known phrase in English. It means that if you are not monitored or not monitored enough, you will break the law. Because of this, um, in most normal states, um, the tax authorities have started to rely on what we call third-party reporting. It means that banks, my bank will report my deposits, the interest rates I have, and my employer, which is NHH, will report to the tax authorities what kind of salaries I have, and I will be taxed accordingly to this. And they do this because there is overwhelming evidence from research and also from experience within the tax authorities in different states that when individuals self-report, they cheat. Cheating goes up. That's also, of course, the reason for why we have police in the first place. Some monitoring will reduce crime. Secrecy jurisdiction is actually preventing us from enforcing the principle of third-party reporting, just confer all the difficulties that the EU have had over the savings incentive, and that's just within EU states. So basically, the tax havens will leave the choice of reporting to the taxpayer. Now, this just simply triggers more tax evasion, um, and it also makes it more costly to collect tax revenue. So that's another point related to the costs of asymmetric information. There is a common perception in the economic literature, that's my own peers, that tax havens are basically low tax jurisdictions that offer opportunities for tax avoidance. Now, the term tax avoidance is basically um, legal tax planning. Um, and there is increasingly also a notion that the days when you could hide money uh, in these jurisdictions are done. It's a pattern of the past. Um, is this really true? Um, there is very clearly a gray area between legal tax planning and strictly illegal tax planning. Why? Because firms, law firms, auditing firms, are pushing the limits of what they think they can do, how they can interpret the law. And sometimes they overstep this, we could call it the thin blue line, and they end up in court and they end up also, in some cases, being convicted. So because of that, there is a logical sequence of arguments here that says that if tax havens encourage tax planning, inevitable following from that will be tax evasion as well. So it is plainly not true that they only offer opportunities for tax planning. A side effect of tax planning is also that there will be tax evasion. The second point I make here is that the ability to hide money is surely not something of the past. We have just this year been seen scandals of money laundering with the HSBC bank. We've got new disks and files from Jersey with, uh, with account holders and so forth. So surely there is still secrecy, there is still a hiding game going on despite all that is being done. One of the things I would like to talk about is ring fencing, this sheltered tax law regime and tax domicile. So I've told you the firms that are registered in these tax favored legislations cannot have local operations, physical firm operations, employees. Sometimes they can't even use the currency. Um, so if you're in Mauritius, you cannot use the local currency, so you have to conduct all your operations in another currency. But these firms are tax domiciled in the tax haven based on where the real management functions are at the board level. Now, in order to get that right, they will have to require locals to be part of the firm's boards. And there has been a critique over that these locals are having 
hundreds if not thousands of board positions and they possibly can't be board members and because of this they have created a new thing called corporate board members but these corporate members board members are just local firms drawing from the same pool of people that already are in the tax haven so nothing is really changed, but these firms are really claimed to be doing the jobs that board members of these tiny jurisdictions otherwise couldn't cope with. So I think the question is still out there. Is there how many instances of false tax domicile is there out there? We don't know. This is shrouded in secrecy. It is a lingering question if some of these are just straw men. And it is, I should remind you, not uncommon in these jurisdictions to use undated letters of resignation for local board members. And the argument that the secrecy jurisdictions do, uh, make for this is that they have them for administrative ease. So I'm a board member, I've signed the letter of my own resignation, but it's not dated, it's kept with someone else, the owners of the firm or the corporate board member or the service provider that helps out. But I could be, re I could be fired at any time of convenience of the other guys. Now, such letters are, of course, if we think about it, a very powerful tool to instill obedience onto board members who derive a significant part of their income from such service. And this practice is not common in normal states. Let me give you an example of this called the Sark Lark. In the 1980s and 90s, the Channel Islands, Jersey and Guernsey, became famous for the Sark Lark. The laws in existence at the time allowed you to be registered at the island of Sark, which was a tiny island if you used Sark board members and held your board meetings there. Sark had no taxes, no financial supervision, no firm registry. So firms could basically do what they pleased if they were being tax domiciled there. Mr. Croshaw, who uh, was taken to court in the UK because some of the firms where he was a board member for um, and also a director for, turned out to be engaged in illegal activities. Uh, it turned out when he came to court and the court, um, the state attorney presented evidence that he was a board member for 3,378 companies. <laughs> um, well, this is actually not a wild figure. If you're laughing of this, the truth of the matter is that th there are figures like this around today in these jurisdictions. Just think about the tiny island of the British Virgin Island with 19,000 inhabitants, right? It's the same figures you will see there if you look into it. Now, well, the High Court of Manchester basically looked into the evidence and said that he could possibly not be the board member here. He was a straw man and because of this they convicted him um, from acting as a director for any UK companies. But there are still firms today using SARC board members. SARC has grown, its population is now 900 instead of 600. And it really just shows you that what is really going on here is at least sometimes doubtful. And it is very hard to figure out what the realities are for the tax authorities because they are shrouded in secrecy. Only when they invoke information exchange um, requests and they are being answered properly, we can really figure out what is going on. But I will talk about that later. This is basically another example based on what I just said. This is Barack Obama who talks about the Uglian House in Cayman Island where 19,000 firms are, are registered and he says, can these firms really be managed from, uh, from, from this tiny island and this, uh, this tiny building? It's sort of just an example of that. Some of the things that are going on here, we should be doubtful about. And remember that they can create this, and this is another point I want to make, they can create this because we have this rule that the firm is subject to tax where its real management is. Would we, as economists or as political scientists, have written the law differently if we could start with blank sheets? That's a very interesting question. Should we worry about this? Well, we have defense lines. 
Um, countries have what's called control foreign company rules in Norway, that is NUKUS, which are aimed at taxing people who have tax haven firms. Even if they haven't received dividends, you will be taxed based on the share of the company's income. But the requirement for these firms is basically that you're in control of the company and in order for the tax authorities to know that you're in control of the company, they have to know that you have the company. You have to self-report. And then we know that some people don't self-report. Okay? And secondly, even if you report that you have this thing, what is to prevent you from, if you are a crook, to just have nominees as shareholders so that you get below the bar of, say, 50% ownership share, and by doing so, escape the application of this type of rules. We know that this is going on because, again, we have had court cases in different countries where we see that this is going on. Now, we also have domestic law, of course, where we could actually say that you are not really conducting management activities in the tax same and you're doing it from here, so we're going to move the company. But that's very hard to prove and a very cumbersome process. Then we have the information exchange treaties, which are very useful, but in order to use them, we have to know something on beforehand. I cannot go and ask if Peter Jones has an account in Jersey or in the Cayman Islands. I have to prove that he is linked to this jurisdiction and that I have a real question related to, say, tax evasion or something that justifies my question. Only then will they, will they reply. So I have to have information from elsewhere before I can go to them. And a more scientific approach to these treaties is basically this. We, they are useful, yes, but we don't know how large the iceberg is because the guys we, 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 we catch here are the guys that are sort of sticking up below the water. And it is very hard to assess what the shadow numbers really are here. And finally, the information exchange treaties do not really get away with the main culprit here, the ring-fenced legislation and the way tax domicile is, is structured. Uh, but they serve as a very, very useful point of tackling um, these problems. The question is just how far they will go and evolve, or evolve and what kind of political cohesion the OECD can get in order to put more pressure into these, these uh, treaties. Um, since these secrecy jurisdictions make a living of concealing information, they are harming economic growth and they are particularly harmful to poor countries. It's again the ability to hide and conceal that creates these effects and that allows individuals and corporations to escape the full consequences of the things they're doing. So in the continuation now I'm going to speak about those things and I'm going to have a special emphasis on poor countries. Uh, and, and the reason why is that poor countries are at particular harm partly because they are having less resources relative to us to tackle the problems that are following from a tax haven activities. Um, let me just start by giving you examples of evasion of regulation in just a few areas. One is safety uh, in transport and the environment. We had the Scandinavian star accident in Norway where there were safety breaches. We still don't know who, the, who owned uh, this ship. Um, so if you wanted, for example, to bring the owner of the ship to court for murder, if that was something uh, you thought he had committed, you, you couldn't, we can't find it. We don't know who he is. Similar problems to oil spills, removal of shipwrecks. If these vehicles or vessels are hidden in uh, an anonymous corporate uh, structure, we cannot find who the ultimate owners are. The insurance is not enough to, co to cover the externalities that follow from whatever happened to them and they are home free. National safety, I mentioned here Anders Bering Braving, who had an, ac an account in Antigua. The Washington sniper came in with a false passport to the US, shot 10 people to dead. And we've got various scams going on with shell companies that I'm sure Jason Sharman is going to talk more about tomorrow. And I've mentioned already the financial um, sector uncertainty created by 
opposite risks. One of the things that, that is allowed in some secrecy jurisdiction is that you can use other countries' suffixes, company suffixes. So for example, you think you're dealing with a Norwegian firm because it has the suffix <coughs> AS, which is limited responsibility, <coughs> but it may actually be a firm from Mauritius because there you can freely borrow and use any suffix you want. So if you're worried about where your law of court is, or if you're worried about um, the difficulties of handling a partner, partner that after a while beho behaves irresponsibly, you better first check whether this firm is registered in the Norwegian firm registry before you conduct trade with him. But that creates transaction costs. Um, we have examples of insider trading from corporations where the owners are hidden in, in, in tax havens, where the guys behind the companies are red flagged if so they are really not allowed to trade shares, but they are hiding behind these vehicles. And we can sort of walk any sector here where it is possible to do this, and we can see that harm is being done because you can conceal information and obtain anonymity. I would like in particular to talk about phishing, because it is probably there where we can sort of trace all the f or the full set of externalities. It is a common phrase, phrase in fishery economics uh, and in political science as well, called illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing. And it is widely acknowledged that ship registration in these states are also associated with jurisdictions that we normally think of as just tax havens, but they are also what is called flag of convenience states. Examples mentioned in, in an OECD report is uh, Bermuda, Cayman Island, Cyprus, Isle of Man as examples. I think there, there's, there's a whole list of these things. One of the problems with these, with these uh, vessels is that they come in and they violate fishing <coughs> regulations and because of that make it very hard to handle and manage fish stocks in stocks that are threatened. Um, and under depletion. Uh, we also know that some of these trawlers are, are creating havoc to coral reefs and outside poor countries where they don't have a coastal guard, they are basically at liberty to do whatever they want to do. Um, so this is the economic side to it, but this brings me to my, my second slide, which, which uh, you will see in a short while, and I'm going to make the point that with tax havens we're not only talking about harmful economic activities, um, or violation of insider rules or anything, we're also talking about murder of human beings. We're actually talking about ethics. And we have to ask ourselves as a society, how far should we go? I mean, the, it is the ministries of finance in most countries who have been handling the tax haven problems because they have been occupied with tax planning and tax evasion. But what I've already shown you is that the implications of tax havens are much, much broader than just that. And they end up sometimes in murder. The United Nations have a project on human trafficking, that is human beings being sold as slaves for different purposes. Um, and in the fishing industry, in these pirate uh, ships, sometimes referred to as floating coffins or slave ships, I've just picked one example of many. I could have given you a whole list. There is these big reports about this. This is 49 Cambodian workers who had served aboard such a slave ship, where 59 of them had witnessed that the captain murdered a crew member, and one 19-year-old guy had witnessed two decapitations. That's just one of many examples. Um, we have another example of uh, 39 Burmese fishermen who all died uh, of thirst because this pirate ship didn't, or the captain of the pirate ship, did not want to go uh, to shore uh, to resupply it because he feared he would be arrested. These people who work on these ships are sometimes chained to their workstations. They enter the contract sometimes where they were minors, and they are being killed. And these firms are registered, again, in secrecy jurisdictions, and they are anonymous. We can't trace the owners. So that's food for, for afterthought. We also have perhaps the most, um, what should I say, challenging um, 
things ahead of us when it comes to poor countries. Poor countries are at the fiscal state like Norway was in the late 1880, 1890s, start of the century, because at that time we didn't have we weren't industrialized enough so that we had wage registries that meant that we could tax wages. So because of that, we relied on taxes, taxing land, and Norway had sort of a tax base where 80% of the tax base was property taxes. Now, this has changed, of course. Now, property taxes is almost nil compared to other tax bases. Um, but in poor countries, then, they rely on taxing capital, and they rely in particular on taxing a few large corporations. In Tanzania, a country of, two, uh, of around 20 million, there is around 300 companies that that contributes to, to close to 70% of the tax revenue of that country. The worrisome aspect with, with secrecy jurisdictions is that they are very often used as the intermediaries here for shifting profit income away from poor countries to rich countries. And there are various techniques. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm sure Frian is going to talk uh, a little bit about this and maybe others also. I'm just going to mention that mispricing of trade is one <coughs> technique to shift debt across countries so that you minimize uh, the tax burden in, in a high tax country, the use of financial derivatives, even dating back financial derivatives so that they can extract <coughs> income, just as we saw corporate leaders in the US do with their bonus payments, may be going on here. And then we have all the deals that we know the political elite in some poor countries are, are doing with the big multinational companies, because we see that the companies don't pay tax. They have got agreements that effectively exempt them from taxation. Uh, let me talk about institutions. Some people think that taxes are perhaps the most important uh, driver for economic growth, but that is wrong. The most important driver for economic growth, as we as economists at least have established it, is what we call institutional quality. That is that we have a well-developed legal system, that we have protection of property rights, that we have a well-functioning public bureaucracy, that corruption levels are low, etc., etc. All these are hallmarks of countries that are at a high developed state. It, they are not the hallmarks of poor countries where it very often is the opposite that is going on. Weak institution, corruption ridden, and so forth. We know at the same time from research that if we could triple the institutional quality in a country, we could actually sevenfold economic growth. So this is a very powerful tool. Building institutions are important. Now I'm going to make the claim, as, as the Norwegian Commission on Capital Flight did, that the secrecy jurisdictions are actually providing the ruling elite in these poor countries with incentives to weaken their own country's institutional quality. Why? Well, simply because since we have the secrecy jurisdictions in place, these places provide a much safer haven for stolen assets than if they did not exist. So what I'm saying is that as long as we have secrecy jurisdictions, we have lower costs of stealing. And in countries with weak institutions, it then become more attractive to steal. Do we have evidence for this? Yes, we have. Stealing taxpayers' money means less investments in institutional quality or, for that sake, public infrastructure. Let me give you these three names here and, and dwell a bit on Mobutu, who uh, has been one of the most studied uh, dictators. Studies show that he had sort of um, um, a straw into the, the state revenues, which allowed him to steal between 15 and 20 percent of the national budget in the 1970s. Money hidden in tax havens. He's got big palaces um, around the world. We know that income per capita in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in his country uh, in 1992 was half of what it was when he came to power. This tells us that there is a second order effect of 
weakening institutions that in the end may unravel a country, lose control of the country with conflicts, open diamond mines and, and all these things going on, which tells us how important institutions really are. And then we've got Sonia Bacha, which we know have, uh, have stolen at least three uh, billion US dollars because that's what we've been able to retrieve, but we know there's more out there, we just don't know how much. And Tim Daniels will, will, will talk about this and will also talk about how difficult it is to retrieve these, these countries and much like, much like Jason Sharman is going to tell us that, that it's to, to obtain anonymity is sometimes not only limited to secrecy jurisdictions, the difficulties we encounter is sometimes also related to how what we call normal states are behaving. Um, and you also have evidence that politicians are rewriting the law in order to be able to themselves apply and extract money in this last bullet point here from the teak rainforests. Rules that to start with prevented the political elite to exploit revenues ended up with the opposite. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the fact that secrecy jurisdictions do not only offer a safe place to hide money, they may actually affect the way countries are being governed. Now it's clear that countries will be affected by how they're governed if you tear down institutions, if you kill the head of the uh, economic crime unit, which we saw a year or so in, in Malawi, we, we know that, that, that we're weakening institutions. But it could be that we change the whole constitution to benefit ourselves. Um, in a very famous paper, um, two <coughs> brilliant economists, uh, Ragnar Turvik and James Robinson, challenged the view that the way states are governed, whether we have a parliamentary democracy or whether we have a presidential system, is stable. They said that political scientists tend to think that these forms of governance are stable. And they're stable because of historic facts. And they said that let's look at Latin America, let's look at Africa, and let's see if they're stable. And just to give you an example from their paper, where they set up by saying that there are seven, 27 African countries south of the Sahara. At time of independence, five of these had the presidency, the rest were parliamentary democracies like we have in, in, in Norway and, and most of the European countries. In 2009, all of these con uh, countries had converted to presidency, except for three, which is Mauritius, South Africa and Botswana. Mauritius is a tax haven, and well, you know what South Africa and Botswana are, um, and they're doing quite well relative to the others. Now, there is a rather long list of presidents in these newborn presidencies who have stolen um, from society. And it also seems that these countries have changed their constitutions from good to bad. It is those that remain parliamentary democracies representing a wider body of society that has done the best. I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit later about why we think that is the case in more detail. Um, Secrecy jurisdictions presents an income opportunity. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean by that that if I want to conceal income, I want to conceal income from the tax man, I want to bribe a politician, I want to derive income or benefits that will give me income from that bribe and I can hide it. That's an income opportunity for me. My private income will go up. It is very easy to show you, but I will not show you, that such an income opportunity could lead to lower income for everyone. And one easy way to convince you for why this argument is right is basically to say that if this income opportunity is used to weaken institutional quality, we are going to weaken economic growth and we're going to lower income for everyone. So what seems like an attractive proposition for me as an individual to exploit this income opportunity is in the end going to end with a smaller cake that we all have to share and that's going to leave us with less income. But it is very, very hard to exactly estimate what the costs are because 
how much is being exploited of this income opportunity is really shrouded in secrecy. So what we as economists try to do is to use a proxy for income opportunities to see how countries react to this. And one thing we can do is to look at natural resource richness, because both poor and countries, poor and rich countries have natural resources. We could, of course, argue that when we drill for oil in Norway, we have to have jobs. We have to man the oil rigs. We have to man firms that deliver parts and equipment to the oil industry. So surely just exploring oil and drilling for oil must create more jobs than if you were to, say, use a tax haven to benefit your own private income. That may be true. But I'm not going to take that argument further. I'm just rather going to show you something that has startled economists called the paradox of the plenty or the resource curse, which is that over the last 40 years, countries rich in natural resources of all kinds, not only oil or gas, but all kinds of natural resources, have on average had lower economic growth than other countries. So this type of income opportunity is really bad for you. And this is measured here by up here we've got growth, and here it should really be export of natural resources in percentage of gross domestic products. And here all these dots are countries. So you see these countries that are up here have very high growth, but they also have fairly low endowments of natural resources. The more you're going to the right here, the more natural resources you have. Then you've got some countries who actually have a lot of natural resources, but they have negative economic growth. But then you've got an outlier up here who seems to have a lot of natural resources, but also quite high growth. But the average, the regression line here between all these dots shows us that there is a negative relationship between economic growth and natural resource richness. But there is, as I said, country variation in this sample. Some countries are doing really good. So what sets them apart? What explains this resource curse? And this, there is a massive literature on, on this, so I'm going to give you two of the high points of this literature. Three Norwegians, I'm happy to say, who control for absolutely almost everything you can think of that could influence the reason for this negative relationship, and they find that resource-abundant countries become growth winners or losers, depending on the quality of their public institutions. Good institutions means growth, which means that if we go back to this thing here, this country here has good institutions, this country here has got bad institutions. And then you've got Buscini, Peterson and Ryan in another famous publications, who shows just the same that it is the combination of institutional quality and the ease with which you can explore natural resources that depends whether you are part of the resource curse or not. If you have open diamond mines, that's bad for you because any tug can come in and steal those diamonds. And it is then much more attractive to tear down the institutions that should govern what is a common resource to the nation. But this tells us that secrecy jurisdictions is part of the resource curse because I've just told you that we have evidence for the fact that secrecy jurisdictions affect institutional quality. So they're actually behind part of the, the, the pattern behind explaining the resource curse. There is, of course, other things that, that makes institutions bad. Lack of money, lack of economic development. But secrecy jurisdictions is part of this. And it explains to a certain extent why poor African or Latin American countries are hurt by the resource curse, whilst Norway is one of the countries that is high up there with high endowment of natural resources, but also high growth. So what I've just told you is summarized in, in this figure here, that countries with good institutions, it is the same thing, are unaffected by the resource curse. They are here. Countries with bad institutions have this negative relationship. Um, 
So, in a very innovative study, two researchers asked, is it so, could it be so, that if we try to categorize all these countries that have resource endowments, that they actually fall into categories? Could it be that there is mostly presidential rules in these countries with bad institutions? Or is it the opposite? Or is it the presidential regimes are all countries with good institutions? It's the parliamentary democracies that are here and that are hurt by the resource curse. And what they find is, of course, that the good institution countries are all parliamentary democracies. And their explanation for this in poor countries is that unlike the United States, where the presidency is followed by balances and checks, in poor countries, the power in a presidential regime is gathered in few hands, where the president is much more almighty than what you typically find in a Western-defined um, democracy like the United States. Um, so research show then that presidential systems are less able to transform increased income opportunities into growth, in particularly in poor countries. And that the resource curse here seems to affect presidential systems and not parliamentary systems. And we should worry about that personal enrichment through a political career makes it more tempting to change the political system. For opportunistic politicians, that's the point I'm going to make, tax havens represents a useful tool to adapt policies towards personal gain. And they also have an effect on what kind of people choose to become politicians. And they may also have this side effect that the proportion of bad politicians in poor countries are larger than they would have been if we did not have secrecy jurisdictions. Final point, um, we should stop confining the problem of tax havens to just that of tax evasion and tax planning because the picture I have sort of painted for you here is much, much broader than that and it affects all sides of society. Um, so what do we do? Well, I don't have an easy answer to this. I have already said that I think the information exchange treaties that the OECD has started on is useful. Um, I am not so sure that they ever will be enough. And because of that, I'm proposing to you that if we think about this, um, the United Nations failed to create the World Trade Organization. I mean, after the First World War, we had, war tra we had trade wars with export subsidies, import duties that prevented trade. Countries realized that trade and was being hampered and that economic prosperity because of that was being hampered. So in the end, we had a parallel <coughs> track going on to the UN track. We had a track where 11 countries said that we believe in free trade, we believe that countries should defend themselves against harmful tax practices, and we are going to band together in a free trade type of union. Now, these 11 countries became 33 countries when the United Nations failed and they became the World Trade Organization. Um, this took us a good well, 50 years to create. We have trade, uh, free capital flows came about in Norway in 1992. Before that, you had to apply for an export license of money. We have fundamentally part the same type of problems as with free trade. We have the problems that we have some states that have invoked legislation and rules that causes harm in other countries. And we have yet to establish a unified framework for how we defend ourselves against that. The OECD is trying with information exchange treaties, but the problem is that they are a group of 30-something rich countries, and there are tax havens among them, 
and there are larger countries among them, like the UK, with strong interests in maintaining the city of London as their main financial centres, that aren't too keen on change. And that's why I worry about the political cohesion and traction with the OECD initiative. And that's why I'm asking, I'm asking you also, if, could it be harmful that we have a second track where we try to, to, to create what economists call a focal point on the other side of the wall where we all try to figure out what is legislation that is acceptable when it comes to free capital movements. I don't think we actually have the choice if we want to claim that we are ethically driven in what we do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A uh, small gift, it's far below, the worth is far below the taxation level, so there may be no problem for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, before you leave, we have a few, some, some minutes extra now. So if any of you have any questions specifically to Mr. Schellerup, please, there is your chances now, and you will come, I will come back to you, to the audience, chance of giving comments and ask questions in the moderated debate later today. But if there is something you really want to comment to Mr. Sheldrup, please. Yes, please, rise and present yourself. I'm Tanya Esbert, working for NORAD. Uh, I wondered if you could just say a few words about this second track you mentioned. What could that be? Well, I, I think it could be just like what GATT um, started out as, um, fundamentally carving out what kind of externalities from legislation that we find unacceptable and what kind of defense mechanisms a state could invoke against them. Such, such a thing could be, for example, that or could be initiated by, say, Norway sitting together with uh, a group of countries that has a like-minded uh, set about how they think about tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions, and sit down and carve out rules of what is acceptable and not acceptable in this setting. Much like Norway did when it came to cluster bombs and, and mines, uh, a small group of, of countries, lots of skeptics in there. In the end, we ended out with a convention against this. It works. We know that some countries will never sign under it, the United States being one of them, but the United States are among those countries that whenever it is opportune to take this convention to heart, they are bringing it forward and say, this is against this convention. So I'm saying that that type of track where we start with a group of countries that says that we, we, we as an international community, much like international trade, are not served well by having these tiny jurisdictions in our midst with legislation that surely are harming us in various ways. How do we cope with this? And then based on that and this small initial initiating group creating traction, building on that. GATT started out with 11, became 33, and is now the World Trade Organization. <laughs> so that's, that's just one. There may be other. There, there is another um, openness um, uh, guarantee uh, thing, which is that if you, which has been proposed, which I think is also uh, just an example of a good idea, where if you are, say, drilling for oil or, or, uh, or something um, outside a developing country, you, are, you have to write the contract before you're awarding the license that you are waiving secrecy if you're using these jurisdictions. So you're saying, I'm, I'm going to drill for oil here, but everything is going to be transparent. And then this country will have to say, OK, you will not be awarded the, the right to drill on this block unless you're signing this contract. That's a very interesting thought we'll come back to in the moderated debate. It's parallel to the cluster bomb <laughs> convention. Please, you had a question? Yeah, Please I rise and yeah. present yeah. yourself. Yeah. My name is Eleni Bank. I come from the Norwegian Trade Campaign and Campaign for the Welfare State. Uh, I have a question to you regarding that second track. Given the strength <coughs> of financial sector at the moment, and, uh, and given Norway's interest in tax haven, the Norwegian Oil Fund has uh, established itself in uh, or subsidiary in, uh, in the tax haven, what incentives do you think OECD countries would have to create such a second track? 
<clears throat> that's a very good question. I, I personally think they are very low. Um, one reason for that, as I said, is that the, uh, the OECD countries are determined to follow their own track, which is the Information Exchange Treaty track. Um, and secondly, uh, there are countries in there who are clearly tax havens uh, or secrecy jurisdictions, and these countries uh, are clearly against a second track. Um, uh, another point is, of course, that the OECD, as I said, um, does not represent poor countries. Uh, and I've told you uh, just now that poor countries are perhaps the group of countries that are harmed the most. But paradoxically, uh, sort of a catch-22, if you like, is that since I'm claiming that the ruling elite are the ones who are exploiting the system, the ruling elite will also be against change. Uh, which tells us that change will have to come from the rich world initially, largely at least. Um, but that's a paradox. Okay, then we go back to there. Uh, yeah, okay, one more question. Yeah, my question is where you have ended, and I'm just wondering if the ruling elites are the most corrupt, for example, from where we come from. Um, who's going to help us out of this mess? Mm -hmm. And if the Western countries uh, are also benefiting from our situation in the poor countries, what's the fate of the poor? Uh, do you have any ideas? Mm. OK, very challenging question. Come on. Yeah. No, um, I, think, I think that point is, is a very good one. Um, it's, it's very worrisome. Um, <laughs> um, and that is why I say that we cannot afford to rely on the OECD. Simply we cannot. If we're, if we're worried about the ethical side of this, that people are actually being killed at the ultimate end of some of these structures, um, the question is uh, if we as a civil society um, can afford not to have a second track. And that second track will have to come from the rich countries that benefit the least from these structures. I'm not sure that is my own country. Uh, but Norway has at least tried. We have proposed this. And now it is sort of for up for the politicians to see if they embrace this idea. So far, they're not. So in that sense, your, your outlook is bleak, admittedly. My name is Mohamed Kone, and I come from Sierra Leone. Um, as you are presenting, I saw, I saw Sierra Leone in all the presentations, because um, for our country, we have um, 26 mineral and oil is coming up, but um, the country is so, so much poor. But the multilateral companies that are operating in these countries are coming from, are coming from the Western countries. And they have the regulations, they, ha they have all what it takes to make sure that um, the African country or poor countries get better. But yet still, they take away all the goods and leave our country very poor. Civil society is very, very poor in most African countries. They are not being supported. And then weak institutions. I don't know how, how much we can do or how much the Western countries can do to help civil societies in these poor countries so that um, they can challenge government. It's very, very difficult to challenge government, except you have, you, have the, you have what it takes to challenge your government. I don't know what you people can do so that um, civil society will continue to challenge government on all of these issues. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, well, what you're essentially saying is, is also that part of this reform then will have to come from the inside. You have, you have somehow to have the people have a good ruler, and then also this Western initiative to, to come about um, if we're going to be successful. Um, um, I don't know what the realism is. I think, this, I think this is going to be a very long haul, a very long battle and a very difficult battle, and that the odds are to begin with stacked against this, simply <coughs> because um, it is the wealthiest who benefit the most from this. Um, <coughs> and that's why it is so hard to, to, get, to get this across. And this is why I'm saying that the con trying to awaken the Western countries by saying that this is not just about tax planning or tax evasion. This is about the fact that uh, the marine environment outside states like your own are being depleted and, and, and eroded by 
vessels who are owned by corporations where you cannot trace the owners. You don't have money for a coast guard, so you cannot stop these guys. Um, you've got child abuse because some of the people who work on these boats are, are, are children who are being enrolled and, and, and abused and so forth. So you've got all these things, things going on and, and you're much more vulnerable to this than us because after all we have a Coast Guard, we, we are taking care of these things to a much larger extent. Um, but the question is just as moral human beings if we should tolerate this or, or not. It is sort of a test about who we are in the end. Thank you very much.